Let's talk about the camp store. Let's talk quickly about the camp store. Look at what we got today. These are all the rage right now. This, if you have a black light in your life, then you have to have this shirt right here. Even if you don't, this thing is so good. This is if you wanna don't want to do the color run, but you want to look like you did the color run. There you go. Also, this one right here. I know that there's at least 50% of you that will appreciate this shirt today. And then my favorite, my favorite because this makes me have a cookies and cream ice cream instantly. As soon as I see this, I just go, yeah, this is the Frappuccino shirt, cookies and cream Frappuccino shirt. But seriously, these things are, they're basically selling out. So you gotta get one of those. This is an awesome shirt. And uh, did you guys know this summer is the 70th year of camp on Word Alive Island? Crazy, crazy. 70 years to think that camp's been happening right here. So this shirt, this is the OG shirt from the very first summer of Word Alive Island. All right, so this is a special edition only this year because it's our 70th anniversary shirt and you can represent this and tell your friends 70 years have been going on. Also, you've probably been collecting a lot of stuff this week. Rocks and pine cones and sticks and stuff. And so you are gonna need a bag to carry all of that stuff around with. You can get one of these bags right here. It's uh, super comfortable and soft. Anybody get one of these yet? They're, they're awesome. Yeah, right there, he got one. It's so good. These are not in the, in the camp store. Here's a couple of books from the camp store. This one's called Faker, How to Live for Real When You're Tempted to Fake It. It's a nice, uh, easy read for you. You'll like that one. Also, this one is called Authentic, along the same lines as the last one, Developing the Disciplines of a Sincere Faith uh, by James McDonald. Oh, and this one called Keep Paddling. Anybody remember this from last year? Keep Paddling. This is a, a really, really short book, hardly even a book, but this book is all about how you can stay in the raft of life, how you can stay with your faith uh, when, when things get crazy, all right? So stop in, check that one out at the camp store. You'll just have to go to the camp store and see who wrote it. All right, that's it for the camp store. Also, don't forget who in here has done, who, who has escaped from the room? Anybody in here escaped from the room? All right, you still can escape from the room today. It's not over yet. Also, anybody in here do arts and crafts on Tuesday? It's coming back today, arts and crafts. Martel, it is gonna be back today, so you can do arts and crafts. You can make a friendship bracelet today at arts and crafts if you want. Arts and crafts, it'll probably be in the coffee house again today, so make sure you do that. One last thing, we have youth group family time happening today. Youth group family time. So, pay close attention. X Factor. You guys, oh, there you go. You guys are in Pine Pavilion. Grace Church, Boathouse, Faith Church, Coffee House. South Clinton Baptist. You're in Pine Counseling Room, which is right over here. Where's, uh-oh. Oh, Picnic Pavilion, Exalt. Where's Zalt, Exalt? You guys are in Picnic Pavilion, which is where the Gaga uh, Court is. People's Baptist Church. You guys are in the White House Porch. Shenandoah Valley Baptist Church. You guys are uh, White House Lobby right. Bethel Baptist Church. You guys are in White House Lobby left. Cedarville Baptist. You guys are on the snack place porch. Emmanuel Dutch Hill Bible Church. You guys are gonna go in the escape the room and then hopefully you can get out. Uh-oh. How do you say that, b -Rai? Iganshu International School. Whoever that is here from there, you guys are in the dining hall on the blue team side. Blue team side. The Christian Gospel Fellowship. You guys are on the island office porch. And then Salem Bible Church. Yes, you guys are going to the summit. 
And that is for youth group family time today at 11.45. You guys, we have tons of youth groups here this week. And they're going to be meeting all over the place. So that's it for our announcements today. Thank you guys very much. You guys are doing great. <laughs> hey, can you guys, for another morning, give our Bible Hour speaker a nice, warm, we're alive island welcome this morning. Hey, hey. How's everybody doing? You good? Did anybody uh, take a shower last night after the rain and all that? Or did you just use the rain as a shower? Yeah. Snack Shack. Yes, I love that. Stop. All right, that's good. That's, I got to tell you, the power is incredible when you say those two words. It's incredible. So um, anybody remember what we spoke about yesterday? Uh, I knew this would happen. Wow. I knew this would happen. I knew this. You help me, help me pick someone out. Just go grab somebody. Go grab somebody. Yeah, go ahead. Because I'm going to get in trouble. This guy, come on over, bro. Give it up. Give it up. Give it up for my man. Snack Shack. Snack Shack. See? The power. The power. Stop. Dude, you just got the Snack Shack clap. See? It's power, right? All right, stop. So, so what was yesterday? You got to talk into the mic here. It was about David and Goliath. Okay, and what specifically about David and Goliath did we... Yeah, right. <laughs> He wasn't scared to go into... Okay, you remember this one? Remember this? What was it? Give me five. Remember that? Because why? They were what? Yes, my man. What's your name? Wes. Wes. And where are you from, Wes? North Carolina. Okay, I promise this might be the creepiest thing you see all day. But here's the thing. I got to tell you a story, Wes. When I was um, five years old, I got a Christmas gift from my grandmother. And it was a big five by three clown that freaked me out. Isn't that crazy? You like clowns? <laughs> That's for you, bro. Take, take it and terrorize your cabin. Give it up for my man, Wes. Good job, bro. Yes. So, yeah, when I was five years old, my grandmother gave me this big picture. I mean, it was the creepiest clown you've ever seen, and it even had a tear in its eye. It was crazy, right? And uh, I was so bad, it terrorized me. I was, I was having nightmares, and my parents took, took the clown picture down, never to be seen again. And since that day, I've always had this, like, fear of clowns. Anybody else have a fear of clowns? And I think it's a healthy fear of clowns, because clowns are creepy. You know what I'm saying? Like, they just are. Anybody, like, do clowning at home? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Anybody? No. Nobody do clowning. All those guys right they're, they're clowns. It's the clown room. But anyway, today, today we're going to talk about fear. We're going to talk about the fear. But before we get to that, I want to show you an island picture. It's not as glamorous. Look, look at that. It's close up of the hair. Right? I had somebody come up to me yesterday and say, hey, bro, can you teach me? how to do the q-tip hair and I, that is a hidden secret you're gonna have to pay 25 bucks with a session with me and i'll teach you how to have that hair and then you'll lose it a few years later so anyway that was uh that was island uh 1988 uh me and my buddy john having a party at the end of the year hey let's pray and we'll get started with today's message lord thank you so much for the time we get to be here thank you lord for this very special island where so many lives are being impacted, not just this week, but have been impacted year after year after year after year. And I thank you for that, that we can come here, that we have the freedom to come here. And I pray, God, that you would speak through me today as, as we talk about something that is quite heavy and that maybe even convicting for some. And I pray, God, that we would uh, remove the distractions, be focused on what it is you <clears throat> want for us to hear, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Take out your Bibles, get your Bibles. I, there's a bunch of them in the house today, right? Come on, this is my Bible. I love my Bible. Mwah! All right. Yes. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. 
And so, over the past few days, we've talked about being real, right? We've talked about real truth. I don't know if you recall Monday. Uh, Monday seems like a year ago, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And, and we talked about this whole idea of darkness and light. You remember that? And then Tuesday, we talked about real faith. And if you recall, we spoke of Peter having this faith gumption to get out of the boat and experience the miracle instead of sitting on the boat like the rest of the disciples and watching a miracle take place. And then, of course, yesterday, we talked about real boldness. And uh, David took five smooth stones and only used one of them, knowing that in the future, those other stones were going to represent the slain of Goliath's family. And we spoke about this boldness that it requires for us to engage in a fearless life. Well, today I want to talk to you about real fear. Because here, let's, let's just face it. We live in a world that is incredibly complicated, don't we? Don't we? It's very complicated. And for many of us this week, this is a retreat away from the complicated world that we live in. And so today we're going we're gonna to talk about fear. And, and it's unfortunate, though, what the, the aspect of fear that we're going to speak of is something that many of us have glossed over. And I, I, I truly believe that we need to have a healthy fear of this particular subject. We're going to talk about sin. Look at your neighbor and say, uh-oh. Look at your other neighbor and say, oh, snap. Here we go, right? Yeah. Oh, snap, right? Sin. Sin is one of, listen, listen, sin is one of those words that's kind of old-fashioned, isn't it? Like, most of us really don't, we just, it's kind of a nebulous idea. Sin, well, what is sin? It's just like, it's stuff you do, right? Or maybe it's bad stuff. Well, let me kind of give you a biblical perspective of sin, and I'm going to kind of take a a few of the ideas in Scripture. In John, it says, 1 John, it says, sin is any wrongdoing, okay? There's another Scripture that says the idea of sin is missing the mark. And so sin is simply the wrongdoing. It's when we miss the mark of God. God is holy and perfect. And if you were with us last night at the campfire, you heard Brian speak about missing the mark and missing the idea of of ultimately God is holy and perfect. And well, we're not. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not perfect. Isn't that fun to say? You're not perfect. See, sin... That's what sin is. Sin kind of is that thing that, that you and I all have in common where we all, part- okay, that's good. You, you guys are like having fun, too much fun telling your neighbor that they're not perfect, right? Oh okay, yeah, stop. <laughs> I'm serious. But see, here's what happens. As Christians, we love to talk about God's love. And God's love is something that we, it's like we gush all over. And even in the context of the world, in our society and culture, we think of God's love in like a Hollywood romantic way. We even sing songs about God in a, in a romantic, and listen, he's madly in love with us. That's the beauty of it. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. He, he loves us so much. But I think so many times we, we allow that to gloss over and miss the idea of how much he loves us in spite of us. Because it's way bigger than that. It's way more complex than God just simply loving us. Like we love pizza or we love, you know, a milkshake or something. It's way bigger than that because I love milkshakes. You know what I'm saying? But listen, we have to get past this Hollywood delusion of love. Can we, can we talk real today, guys? Can we? Thank you. We've got to get past the delusions the world has presented us. Romans chapter 1, I believe, just as, uh, this is what I love about the Bible, and why, why I say this is my Bible, I love my Bible, and I kiss it, because there's truth here. And I think if you're here today, and you, and you lean into this truth, I think it can change your life, and it can empower you, and you can leave here, not just today, but this week, incredibly hopeful in a hopeless world. So Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 is truly about God's love for us, but in an honest way, not in the Hollywood delusional way. You see, it's contrasted by the, the, what the world says about the activities of man. The scripture's just honest about it. It's honest about our sin. 
And so today, in order for us to really, all these things that we've talked about, the real faith, and we've talked about, you know, uh, real truth, and, and yesterday, real boldness, and we're talking and celebrating all week about being fearless in the world we live in, I, I think we have to lean back a little bit and say, step back and say, okay, there is something that I have to be real about, and I have to, be, I have, to real, have a real healthy fear of the results of sin in my life. And so I'm going to talk about a very difficult portion of Scripture. And it's difficult for all human beings, including myself. And so I just want to be honest with you and real. It may offend you, okay? You may, you may not. Can I just say something? We're going to read something in here today, and you probably won't even like it. Because when I read it, sometimes I don't like it. It makes me uncomfortable. You know what I'm saying? But that's okay, because that's what makes this, this so transcendent over the, the, the delusions that you and I encounter every day in the world we live in. So in Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2, we're going to get real. It may make you, make you mad. But do me a favor, okay? Let it speak to you where you are, okay? Let the Word of God speak to you where you are. And so... In order for us to truly understand this idea of being fearless, I think we need to face the reality of us. Point yourself right here. You need to face the reality of you. Okay? So let's pick up Romans chapter 1. And I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? I, I don't think we have all the slides for this, so I need you to listen. Because I think there, there's power in listening. And so I'm going to read Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 2, 6. And then what we're going to do is we're going to unpack it. And I want to just have some real talk observations from the portion of Scripture. And as, let me just tell you this. I said this just a minute ago. There's going to be something in here that I read that you don't like. Okay? Real. You're going you're gonna to be like, I don't like that. That offends me. Because don't we live in the most offended world, like a society in history? Everybody's offended about something. Like, I'm offended that you're, you know, wearing, like, safety goggles for glasses, you know? I'm offended that, you, you know, that you wear Nike. I'm a, and people get offended about everything. And so the Bible does a good job right now just being real, and you're going to be offended. So let's go ahead and read it. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, it says, But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Yes, it says, like, God is ticked off at sin. Verse 19, they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. It's getting real. It's like people try to deny God all the time, but the reality is they know he's there. Because why? Well, they look and they see the earth and the sky. Though through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible quality. So the people that you know that say, there's no God, he doesn't exist, I'm an atheist, I just believe you die, you rot in the ground and cease to exist. Well, guess what? The reality is, is according to this scripture, they really can see the invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. So they have what? Say this with me, no excuse. There's no excuse for not knowing God. Verse 21, yes, they, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. You know anyone like that? Like make up things about God? As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. Verse 24, so God abandoned them. So you mean to say God is angry and then God abandons? Yeah. I'll unpack this in just a few minutes. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desire. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies they traded truth about God for a lie. And so they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen? Verse 26, that is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. It's like God's like, that's what you want, that's what you get. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with one another. 
And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. And the Bible says this, as a result of this, what? Sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Verse 28, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he what? Abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Verse 29, their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. Sounds like 2017 to me. And they disobey their parents. Get an ouch there. Go ahead, you say ouch. Verse 31, they refuse to understand, break the promises, are heartless and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Verse 1 of chapter 2 goes on. Paul is unpacking. Are you guys feeling the weight of this? Verse 1, you may think you can condemn such people. This is where it gets interesting for those religious people who are like, yeah, those sinners. Watch this. You think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. And you have no excuse, the Bible says. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do these very same things. And, and we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Verse 4, don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Verse 5, but because you are stubborn and you refuse to turn from your sin, the Bible says you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Verse 6, he will judge everyone according to what they have done. Everybody take a deep breath. And I'll blow on your neighbor. <laughs> That's heavy, isn't it? The Bible, I love this truth in clarity. And I just want to lay out some real quick, real talk observations from the scripture we just read. So the first observation I want to make from Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, it says that God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people. And here's the bottom line, real talk here. God is angry at sin, okay? It's not like he takes it lightly. He's like, oh, buddy, it's okay. You keep on sleeping with whoever you want to. You, you keep on, you go get drunk and do whatever you want to because you're my buddy. You see, God is not a buddy God. He's the God of the universe, and we are his creation. He is creator. And, and God is not happy about sin. As a matter of fact, the Bible describes that sin angers him. It, it repulses him. It makes him so sick that it, he just, he can't even stand it. It goes on in Romans chapter 2. I just read this, verses 5 and 6, that because you are stubborn and you refuse to turn from your sin, you're storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed and he will judge everyone according to what they've done. Does that, so, does that sound like happy God? Like, oh, you do whatever you want to do, buddy. No, it sounds like God's like, man, I take sin serious. Why? Because I love you so much. That's why. I'm creator, God says, and you are creation. And sin, the things, the wrong things that we do, it repulses him. And, and can I just be real with you? I'm not talking just to you. I'm talking with me too. We're all in this together. And as much as we like to explain wrongdoing, God just can't stand it. It sickens him. And anger and wrath are the biblical expressions used here to communicate God's opposition to yours and my sinfulness. And so the bottom line is this. Listen to me. I need everybody looking. God hates our sin. He hates it. He despises it. He can't stand it. It repulses him and makes him sick. God is angry at sin. And I was thinking about this. 
I um, was bowling. Uh, anybody do bowling? I'm not good at it, but it was just like one of those. It was a youth outing that I was at years ago. And I was bowling. It was an old bowling alley. And it was candle pin. You guys know about candle pin bowling? Anybody know about candle pins? The little pins and the real little ball. And so guys, like, we like to take it and chuck it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to chuck it down the hall. And, and I had the candle pin bowl and I'm like, I'm going to roll this thing as fast as I can. And as I did, I dragged my finger across the wood and this, no lie, a plank went up under my finger. I mean, it was like, it was huge. It went like, past the knuckle. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, hey! Right? It was crazy. Painful. <laughs> I know. I looked at that thing, and I was like, that's not supposed to be there, right? And um, but, so here's the thing. I went, I, they took me immediately to the hospital, right? And they, they numbed it, and then they just took these pliers and just like... It was like this long. It was crazy. It was disgusting. Here's the point. Listen. Had I left that splinter in there, guess what would have happened? My body would have rejected it. Pus. I mean, if I like, I don't want to take it out. I just want to leave the plank in my finger, okay? Thank you. That plank shouldn't be in my finger. My body would reject it because it can't be, it can't have something from the outside in there. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's called an infection. It could cause a disease. It could cause my finger to fall off, my arm to fall off. I could die if I just left it in there. That's kind of how sin is. Like, God can't be around. It, it just, it's just impossible for him to be around a, pe- a people, people who are constantly indulging in sin, doing whatever they want to do. It angers him and it repulses him. He can't be around it. And so ultimately, that first idea, that first observation, real talk observation from Romans chapter 1 is God is angry at sin. But the second observation I want to make is this. It's the second half of Romans 18, uh, 118, and it says, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Like, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And then it goes on in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 and says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? We got to be honest. First, the second observation, you have got to be honest with yourself. I've got to be honest with myself, and I've got to be honest with myself and God. That's the point here. I mean, we got to look in deeper than ourselves and recognize, like, God can't be around sin. Like, God doesn't, he, he, he's angry at sin. And so we've got to be observant of, our, of ourselves. See, we live in a day and age where we're all up in everybody else's business, aren't we? I mean, Facebook, Twi- I don't even know, like, Twitter. Is, do people Twitter anymore? I don't get Twitter, right? I just never have. Like, I have it, but I don't even know why I have it, right? But it's all like gossip, isn't it? It's like everybody's business. Instagram, like, look how good I am, right? You know, we're all in everybody's business. And this whole idea right here is like, it's not about everybody's business, it's about you. Okay? It's about you and it's about God, and and, and you've got to be honest. We've got to be real about ourselves. Because sin is real, and the reality is, is you and I are guilty of sin. Again, sin is any wrongdoing, lying, cheating, thieving, pornography, all sex outside of marriage, God's marriage, by the way, okay? I mean, I could go on and on and on all day, Um, stealing from places that you, I mean, stealing ideas, it's easy to steal ideas, like write homework and like, yeah, it's not really my idea. I just stole it from the interwebs, right? You know, we're real good at that. That's sin. And watch this. We allow our desires, we allow our temptations to redefine conveniently so we don't have to be real about how God sees it. We like to twist things culturally. Well, we're in a new day and age, right? And so it's the 21st century, man. Things have changed. And the reality is like, yeah, but God hasn't. And his word hasn't. 
And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the truth is, is yes, as much as he loves you and I, he's angry about our sin, and sin is the same. It's just the same as it always has been. It's wrongdoing. It goes against God's ways. So instead of suppressing or holding down the truth, we have to be real. Instead of keeping it at bay, we've got to look and be real about ourselves and recognize the sin in our lives instead of trying to hide it, gloss over it, or redefine it. It's interesting enough in this scripture that I just read to you, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, clearly highlights a particular sin that in our day and age is being glossed over and trying to be written, sexual sin, right? In particular, same-sex temptation. See, can I just say something about temptation? Temptation's not sin. Can I just say that? Like, I'm, I, I have temptations all the time, don't you? I mean, I do. But temptation, by the way, Jesus himself was tempted. There's a, like a whole story dedicated to Jesus' temptation in the desert for 40 days. Like, he was tempted, but here's the thing. Jesus never sinned. The example to us is like, temptation's going to come. Temptation's going to go. But that doesn't mean that you have to fall prey to the temptation. And some people in this room have same-sex temptation, right? That's a, that's a real temptation in your life. But when you fall prey and you participate, well, it's who I am, and the world's telling me this is how I'm made, and I'm just going to be free, and I'm going to jump in and do whatever I want to do because that's who I am. Guess what? That's sin. The temptation, that's not sin. Maybe your, it goes on and talks about other sin. There's so many other things that maybe it's your sin is pornography, right? I mean, you've got opportunity I mean, you probably, you don't have your phones with you now, but when you go home, you're going to get, you're going to have all kinds of notifications, right? Maybe some of you already have, like, subscriptions to things that you shouldn't. That's sin. But the temptation, it's on your phone, but you don't have to go in and look at it. The temptation might be there. I think you need to understand that temptation is going to be part of life, and it's not going to disappear magically, is it? I'm, I'm old, okay? No, no bones about, I'm 45 years old, okay? I'm an old dude. And I have, same, I have temptations now that I've had for a long time in my life, and I have to resist those temptations. And that goes back to what we spoke about earlier in the week, having a radical relationship with Jesus, right? It's not going to magically, you're not going to be this like angel that walks around doing nothing wrong. There's always going to be temptations, and you're going to fall, and you're going to, but here's the thing. As it says right here, we've got to be real about ourselves. We've got to be honest by the way, did you know this? Can I give you a statistic that's going to stagger you? 10 out of 10 people struggle with sexual temptation. Did you know that? Everybody say, duh. <laughs> yeah. We have to be honest. I, I think that's the one that's gripping our society right now, sexual temptation and us falling prey to it, it embracing and just living it out. The temptation's not sin, but it's acting on the temptation that is sin, and we have to be honest about it. Stop glossing over. Stop trying to redefine it. Stop trying to put like cultural little like twist to it and say, it's sin, okay, if I participate in it. Now, if I have this temptation, I'm going to struggle with it. I'm going to ask friends to pray with me. I have, a, I have a porn problem. Will you pray with me? I have a same-sex temptation problem. I, I, I need you to pray with me. I need somebody to stand in the gap with me. We got to be real about it and be honest. When we decide to act on our temptations, though, that's when we offend God. And that's sin, and God doesn't like it. He hates it. So we've got to recognize that God is angry at sin. We've got to recognize that honesty is crucial. We've got to be honest with ourselves and our relationship with God. But thirdly, Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 says this, and, and we read it earlier. I'm just rereading it. It says, For ever since the world was created people have seen the earth and the sky, right? It's right before us. Creation is everywhere, right? Through everything God made, they can see, clearly see invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature. Watch this. So they have no what? No excuse, right? The Bible's real clear. It's like there's no excuse for not knowing God. None. So 
The third observation is this. There's no excuses. We've got to stop. Make, we live in an excuse world, don't we? Everybody's got an excuse for everything. We, we excuse uh, LeBron for losing another finals, right? And they have the highest payroll in the whole NBA. And they, you know what I'm saying? We make excuses for everything. <laughs> You're like, oh, snap. He just got two shade of LeBron, <laughs> I need you to track with me. There's no excuses. We gotta stop making them. And we gotta stop making excuses. Like unbelievers, there's no excuse for not believing. That's what Paul says. There's no excuse. Like God's revealed himself in creation, and people see it all the time. And, and, And I don't know, it makes many people uncomfortable. We don't like it. But there's no excuse. We like to think that God, remember it goes back to this whole idea that God is love. And he is. God loved the world. See, his love was expressed in sending his son Jesus. His love isn't expressed in excusing us for our sin. His, his love is expressed in Jesus. And so for us, we have to recognize that God created. And in his creation, Paul clearly says, like, hey, he's showed himself to the world. There's no excuse so we have to stop making excuses. Say, well, you know, they're good people. It's like, well, they don't know Jesus, right? Jesus is the solution to the problem, not the fact that they're really nice people. That's not the solution to the problem. There's no excuse. I think I love Word of Life because, check this out. How many countries? 72? 70 countries. And here's what I love. You're, you'll sit down with... Uh, leaders from Word of Life, and you'll hear not just talking about the island, the island, the island, island. Like what the one for one T-shirt? That's so cool. Did you guys buy those yet? Dude, it's so cool because here's what it is. This is what it is. It's a heart for the world. It's saying we want to take Jesus to the world because men are without excuse. We're without excuse. If we came in here, it became this holy huddle, and we came and we were like, oh, woe is me, woe is the world, and and became like this country club of people, it would be pointless. There's no excuse. So what we can do is go and point people to Jesus, what he's done in our lives. Look at the world. Look at what he's created. God is awesome. He loves you. Yes, he hates our sin. We can take our sin to him. There's no excuse. What happens, though, is believers, Christians, tend to point our fingers and become accusers. And what happens is we miss this scripture In chapter 2, in verse 1, it says, You may think that you can condemn such people. Isn't that easy to do, Christians? We like to look at people who are jacked up, and we miss that, like, we've got, like, that we are more jacked up than they are. We're like 100 pounds overweight, eating our donuts and sipping on our Mountain Dew and pointing fingers at people who are sleeping with other people. And the truth is, is we're just as sinful as they are. Isn't that what happens? And the Bible's real clear. It says, look, you may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad. You have no excuse. So there's no excuse. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. It goes on. Are you guys good? A little uncomfortable? Good, I am. You should, you should be up here doing this, right? <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 21, it says this. Yes, God knew, uh, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish, check this, I want you to listen to this. They began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. Hey, let's make up something that fits us, right? It makes us comfortable. Let's make up things about God. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Verse 22, claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. And you're like, that's, is, can it, we, that's just weird. Where's the clown? You got the clown over there, right? Show, hold that up. Hold the clown up. Is he sleeping? Oh, yeah, hold it. Oh, you already, de- he already decapitated. Is it's that creepy, right? So wait, wait, wait. All right. Yeah. So, so this clown, you like, look at that. People, like, people worship. You put it down now. It's so creepy. It's like, make him, give me. All right. Here's what happens in the world. We, we read this and we're like, you mean people like carved images and worship them? They're crazy. 
we don't do such a thing, right? They worship pieces of wood, like clown-looking things. Like, if you look at ancient idol worship, it kind of makes you feel good about us, doesn't it? Like, they worshiped weird things. Like, they got, like, three heads and ten toes, right? And they got big smile, I mean, one eye. Like, look at the old idols, they're weird. But, but watch this. We love to point the finger and say, look at them. We aren't like that. We're more dignified. But the reality is, listen, listen, listen. We're no different. We're no different. Like, Chris, I did not carve out an idol this morning and, like, bow down and pray to it. No, you didn't. But I know that there's that guy in your life that you worship. You put more attention and love and affection toward that boy in your life than you do Jesus. That's called idolatry. That girl that you have the picture, I don't even know if you guys carry wallets anymore, but I remember when I was a kid, I had this picture of the girl that I was madly in love with that I met here at the island, right? I worshiped her. That's idolatry, man. It's easy to do, isn't it? Sports. We heard our friend last night share her story about basketball and how that was like an idol in her life. We, we, are, we go that direction naturally, don't we? And that's what the, 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 Paul's writing to the Romans. They like carved out things out of wood and made these weird looking things that they worship. But we do the same thing. We worship people. We worship a basketball, a, a soccer ball. We worship academics. We worship, you fill in the blank. We worship it. We worship ideas. Y- your generation is, I think, incredibly, I-, I love your generation because you're passionate about things like issues, right? guess what you do though you worship those issues you like you're all about that issue whatever it might be and you protest and you pick it and you got this big voice and you worship that instead of worshiping that's idolatry that comes natural to the human spirit that's how we are made we are made to worship and so we pick things to worship that aren't god and in doing so we create idols the bible says that's that's idolatry and it's real But it goes on in verse 24. Watch this. So God abandoned them. Say abandoned. Abandoned. That's that's like one of those harsh words, isn't it? Nobody wants to be abandoned. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desire. So God's like this. Okay, you want to worship him? Go for it. You can worship him all you want. You can have at it. And he gives you or he abandons you. Here I am, I love you, I'm here, I sent my son to die for you, hope is in Jesus, life is in Jesus, he is the, he is the singular one you should be worshiping, and what we do is we worship everything else, we do whatever we want to do, and the Bible says that God abandons, and I don't know about you, that, that's a heavy, heavy statement, the first one, like God, like God is angry at sin, like God is angry, but God also abandons sin. And I know this sounds like one of the cruelest things imaginable, doesn't it? Like God abandons people because of sin. And it seems a little over the top, doesn't it? Can we be real? Doesn't it? It sounds like kind of harsh. But I want you to listen to this. God is holy. God is perfect. And God is creator. And it is impossible for him to be in the presence of sin or associated with sin. The word abandons means commits to or gives over or delivers. So if you think about it, it's not cruel. It's kind of like him just letting you like, hey, you want to live in full on reckless sin? Okay, I'll let you do it and let you crash and burn. So he basically gives us over to our desires. Uh, you, you want your, your sexual preference to be the driving force of your life? God will say, okay. Let's see, that, let's see where that takes you. Bitter, angry, broken, hurt, finger pointing. You want, you want your, uh, your idol of sports worship to you know, stay there and you want to continue to, okay, go ahead. You're going to crash and burn. God allows that to happen. You place things before me, God says, okay. He, it, it's it's kind of like he, listen, it's almost like God is like a gentleman's spirit about this. You want to keep doing whatever you're doing? Okay, cool. I abandon you over to it. Go for it. 
It doesn't stop there, though. It goes on. If you were to jump to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, and it'll be up on the screen. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. So all this idea like God abandons, God is angry at sin, like we're idolaters. It's kind of heavy, right? I mean, this stuff is like stuff you're like, dang, I came here this morning. I would have a cool story and walk out like cheering for God. And now you're like making me feel like a dish rag, man. I feel gross and, you know, I, it's, it's going to get better, I promise. And it starts right now that God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still what? Sinners. Sin's no joke, man. It's no joke. It's real. It's so, listen, sin is so real that God took it so serious that he sent his son Jesus to die for our sin. Isn't that crazy? Like God, he saw our sin and was so serious about our sin. He didn't just say, hey, you can go do whatever you want. He actually took action himself and sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. That's serious. That's how serious sin is. Whew. He did for me. He did for you what you and I could never do for ourselves. Isn't that cool? So as heavy as like God is angry at sin and as heavy as like God abandons us to sin and as, and as heavy as all these ideas are, the reality is, is sin is very real and sin has serious effects so much so that God did something about it. And my friends, this is, this is a game changer. This has been a game changer for me. When you realize, like, God took sin so serious that he took action, he didn't just, like, leave us out to, you know, fend for ourselves. He did something and acted in our place through Jesus Christ. That, my friends, is how serious sin is. See, God is angered by our sin. And ultimately, he judges us by our sin. That's, that's just real talk. But here's where... This is where I, I love landing. I'm kind of like what I call landing the plane here. I want, I want you to write this down. There is hope. All, bringing all this together, the heaviness of all the sin we've talked about. Maybe you've been offended. You didn't like it. You're like, I don't like what the Bible says about this. But here's the thing. You don't have to like it, but it's truth, right? And, and the reality is, is there's hope. There is hope. Romans 15, 13 says this. I pray, Paul says, and this is all written to the same people, the same idea. I pray that God, the source of what? Hope. The source of hope will fill you completely with what? Joy and peace because why? You trust him. Yes, you're going to deal with sin issues. Like this is part of our life. There's stuff that's going to come up. You're going to have temptations. It's going to happen. But here's the thing. God was proactive and did something for us. He took sin so serious that he took action through Jesus. And with that, we have hope. Man, we live in, the, in a hopeless world, don't we? And again, many of us are going back to a hopeless situation, whatever it might be. I don't know everybody's situation, but I can generally speak that some are going back to a wrecked home. Some are going back to maybe no home at all. Some are going back to like the perfect home on the outside, but on the inside, it is a mess. Some are going back to the perfect home that everybody's like, wow, you got it all together. And you really do, and it looks really good. And some are going back to, like, I don't even know where I'm going to school. We have so many situations coming up, but here's what I do know. There's hope. And the hope is not found in, in your situation. The hope is not found in you wandering and indulging. And in, like when the Bible says God abandons us to us, that's not where hope is found. That's hopelessness. Hope is found in Jesus. And we've been speaking about this all week long. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. The hope that you and I have is not found in anything or anyone else but Jesus. And if we can let Jesus be the driving force in our relationship with God, that'll affect our relationships with man. That'll affect the temptations that come up around us. 
And you and I, listen, you've heard me say this, your life ain't ever going to be gummy bears, unicorns, rainbows in the sky. And I love Skittles. Anybody love Skittles? Can you imagine the Skittles like rain? That would be awesome. It'll never be that way. Maybe in heaven, right? Lord, maybe you would provide Skittles falling from the sky in heaven. Amen, right? (laughs) But listen, the truth is there's hope. And if if you leave here today with anything, I want you to leave here with this that there's hope. The hope is not in your circumstance. The hope is not found in anything that we can create or do. Our hope is in Jesus. It says, then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. But the bottom line is this, and as I close, this is it. We must be real. Listen to me. Stop glossing over it. Again, I love your generation because you're pretty real. My generation, we like to gloss over everything, like shiny, happy people, like, hey, everything's great, and I'm falling apart inside. We've got to be real about sin, though, and we've got to stop glossing over sin. Call it what it is, but know that there's hope. We can't get, we don't, we can't get offended by that. We have to be real about it and say that that's a real temptation and if i go to that temptation and fall prey to it that's sin and it makes god angry and he doesn't like it and i have to turn from it and turn to him jesus is there and the hope is in jesus listen to me there's hope there's hope and i'm just so proud of you guys for being here this week I'm proud that you're listening in. And I believe God right here today is stirring in some of our hearts to live in that hope. The hope of Jesus. That he came, that he lived, that he died, and that he rose again. And that is the catalyst to our hope. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much. that you were real. And, and you're real in your talk. Like, you don't sugarcoat sin. You, you tell the real truth. But in that real truth is hope, and I thank you for that. So God, help us to be a people who, are, or who really genuinely recognize that sin is not something we should take lightly. So much so that you didn't take sin lightly. You sent your son to die in our place. You, you paid the ultimate price for our sin. Help us, Lord, to live in response to that. I thank you, God, for the week we've had so far. And my prayer, God, is that out of this week, lives will be affected not just for five, six days on an island in New York, but lives will be affected and impacted for years and years and years at home, in the workplace, in school, wherever they go. I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we got quiet time coming up. And then after that, uh, the beach is open. Ninja Warrior finals are going on. Volleyball tournament this afternoon. Thank you guys for your attention and being here. You are dismissed. Turn it back.